Okay, now what are the commonly used cones? Uh, the first cone that we're looking at is the non-negative orthant and uh, it's really e easy to imagine. So here we have our coordinate system in two dimensions and here we have x1 and here we have x2 and then the, the non-negative orthant. It is just this part where both my x1 and my x2 are both positive and uh, therefore the the non-negative orthant is the cone that just takes the x1 axis and the x2 axis as directions and fills up everything here in between. Uh, and it's easy to see that this is a cone because I can take any point from in here, multiply it by a positive scalar and all the entries uh, will, will remain positive. Okay, um, and uh, actually we can take any linear program defined like this and uh, transform it. Uh, so first of all here move the ex out and add a slack variable and so on and transform it into a conic program on the non-negative orphan. So in the first step I'm adding here a slack variable. So a slack variable z that I require to be all positive and um, then I can here replace my inequality constraint with an equality constraint and because I know that my z has to be positive uh, these two problems are equivalent. And uh, what I then do in addition is my target variable x that I'm looking at. My target variable x it could be negative or it could be positive. I don't, I don't know this when I'm starting. Um, so in order to enforce it to be in the non-negative orphaned, I split this up. So instead of a single variable x, I now have two variables x1 and x2 and both of them have to be positive. And uh, everywhere where I had originally considered x, I'm now considering x1 minus x2 and I can still reach the same solutions as before. However, now all my target variables, I can constrain them to be in, a, uh, in the non-negative orphan. And now by doing some additional combinations and so on, I can uh, combine these three here and then I have a single variable y in, a, in, a, in the larger dimensional non-negative orphan and uh, uh, thereby get to the standard conic form. So every linear program and I can rewrite it in the standard conic form for the non-negative orphan. Okay. okay, now we come to uh, optimization problems that we weren't able to, to solve in a nice fashion before. And uh, for that we need the, the more advanced cones for example, now here the second order cone. And uh, the second order cone, um, it's, it's, it's rather simple. It's also called the Lorenz cone or the ice cream cone. And uh, what it does is uh, I take a vector x uh, and then I'm considering all the t that are larger than the Euclidean norm of the, this vector x. And here I have um, uh, in the example of the, the second order cone in three dimensions. That means I'm looking at two dimensions uh, for my uh, first entry and then t, this is the last entry. And, uh, um, 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 and uh, now when I'm selecting u1 and u2, so let's say I'm here, then I need the t to be larger than the Euclidean distance and this exactly gives me this, this ice cream cone opening up. Okay, and um, well, many applications fall under this category. There are many practical examples um, and uh, for example, um, all convex problems with quadratic constraints can be rewritten as a second order cone. Now the formula here you don't have to remember that for the exam. So in this uh, in this lecture, we have a couple formulas that are um, where it's more important to know that a certain transformation exists 
then to actually uh, keep in mind the, the complicated formula. Um, but anyhow, let's uh, here take a closer look. Um, a quadratic constraint here is that in the constraint uh, we have a certain uh, matrix in the middle that was decomposed into, into two parts, so C transpose times C. And uh, for this here then I have uh, a quadratic uh, matrix equation uh, in my inequality constraints. And uh, well, this uh, C transpose C obviously has to be uh, positive semi-definite for the whole thing to, to work out because I need, if I have um, um, an inequality constraint, uh, g of x smaller or equal than zero, I need g of x to also be a convex function for the, for the entire domain of the function to be convex. And here we can rewrite the whole thing and um, in the end, well this here should be q, and in the end we end up with um, um, with a with a formulation um, as a conic program uh, with the second order column constraints. Okay, but now let's see uh, at some of these practical examples that were promised. And the first one we see is total variation denoising. So imagine you have a very noisy data, and uh, this is what we see here on the left hand side. So the gray, the gray points that we have, these are measurements that we have, time series measurements, and they're uh, rather complicated. And from time to time there's like a jump, or there's a, there's a sudden switch in, in the regime. And uh, what we want to do is we want to denoise, and also want to see where these jumps in, in the data have happened. And uh, so what we could do as an easy approach is to have like a sliding window approach or something like that. But with a sliding window approach, usually uh, this is not uh, perfectly reacting, but rather here we would like here uh, have an area where it's uh, rather smooth and then going back up and so on. But what we want to have is to really sharply discover the, the points where our uh, underlying process is changing. And uh, we can that, get that with a so-called total variation. Now, uh, what is the total variation? For the total variation, we look at the distance from one data point to its neighbor. So in a time series, we always consider the points and their neighbors, and now um, the absolute distance between the two of them. And uh, for denoising the time series, what we do is, um, first of all, we uh, have our measurements and the measurements are our y. And uh, we want to have x contain our denoised time series. Uh, so the dimension of x here can be really high. It can be a couple of thousand dimensions when I have uh, that many uh, data points in my time series. And um, for, for the x, I would like x to be close to y. Right? So now if I'm looking at the original measurement and the denoised measurement, I want the two to be close. So here, and I'm taking here the, the squared distance between the original and the, the denoised one. Um, but in addition, I'm adding uh, now the total variation term. So I want the the recover time series or the denoise time series. I want to be I want it to be close to the original one and I want it to not be noisy. And um, this not being noisy is here the second term where I'm looking at the absolute distances between data points and their neighbors. And I have some some uh, scalar that I can use to give a weight to this uh, 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 to this uh, denoising term. And uh, so by, by setting this to zero, I would exactly recover the original time series. And by setting this to something larger, I can say how much I want, how much I prefer a denoised time series over one that stays true to the original measurements. And uh, what we see here as output, uh, it, it really nicely recovers uh, what probably is the, the underlying uh, change in how the, the, the process worked that generated here the time series. And this 
1D denoising problem with the total variation, we can write this down as a conic optimization problem. Uh, so first of all here we have our uh, quadratic distance, which is still actually the same. Uh, but now for the denoising term, we just write here the weighted sum over all uh, tj. And uh, here for the tj, um, um, uh, we can use the trick uh, or the initial trick that we saw in lecture 5 on how to express absolute values. So here uh, we have tj equals yj plus 1 minus yj. And uh, have a look at, at lecture 5. There, there's an explanation how these two inequality constraints here exactly recover the absolute value because there's like pressure from the, the optimizer to exactly push tj into the, uh, into the inequality constraint. Uh, okay, but now let's move over and finally see how this works with the, uh, with the, with the second order column. Now, from the 1D denoising that we saw, let's now move over to uh, image denoising. So now we are in the 2D domain. So now take a grayscale image Y. So in the grayscale image, it's, it's a matrix that contains uh, entries that say whether a certain pixel is zero or white. And now we can also compute the total variation uh, but do that over all pixels, when we look at the individual pixels, uh, for the neighbors in two directions. So here we have the neighbor going right and we have the neighbor going up. And uh, so the total variation here is the absolute um, um, distance squared uh, for the neighbors in the two directions, the sum of them and uh, then the square root. And um, well, we can use this in a similar fashion to um, the total variation term for, for the 1D domain. Uh, and now for, the, um, for um, the closeness of how close the reconstruction is to the original noisy image, uh, we use the so-called Frobenius norm. The Frobenius norm is actually quite easy. It's just uh, the, squared, the sum of all squared pixel distances um, and uh, the square root of that. Uh, and uh, the square root here we get rid of it because here we then also square the norm. So actually what we have here in this first term uh, here, this is just uh, the distance of all pixels squared and then summed up. And, and then the second term here, this is the TV norm. And uh, we now rewrite this whole thing as a second order column problem uh, because um, uh, here we have for every pixel uh, 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 a constraint where we say that the distance to the right and the distance to the top um, and this tij have to be in the second order column. And, uh, and for the second order column, we know that if we have something u and t, um, element of the second order column. Um, that means that um, t has to be larger than the than the Euclidean norm of of the u, uh, and so this exactly gives us then here for this um, uh, constraint here uh, in the the TV norm because the optimizer has an incentive to push the tij down and as small as possible and therefore um, in the optimum uh, we will have exactly uh, the tv norm recovered so uh, in in the maximum we would have here the euclidean norm equal to t and, and this is exactly what we want uh, and now this u here it would correspond so this term here then would be the u that we're looking at. Okay, and uh, now we have a very high dimensional optimization problem suddenly. 
Uh, so if we have a 200 by 200 image, um, then we are already looking at um, 40,000 um, uh, pixels, and um, meaning that we would have a 400,000 dimensional optimization problem with a second order constraint for each pixel. Uh, that's quite a lot. So we would like our algorithms to be efficient and uh, we, we have these efficient algorithms today. This is rather standard practice. And possibly even your uh, camera and mobile phone are, are applying such methods for, for optimizing noisy images, for example, when you're shooting images in the dark. Okay, now on to the last of the three cones that we're looking at in more detail. And this is the semi-definite cone. And uh, for the semi-definite cones, we are looking at elements that are actually matrices. Yeah? So we have here our, uh, this is now the vector space of all n times n symmetric matrices. Yeah? So if we have a matrix now X, your big X, uh, would be cons contained, for example, here in, in, in Sn. And these would be all symmetric uh, matrices, but I'm only looking at the positive definite symmetric matrices. And this is here, this uh, semi-definite cone. And uh, well, the canonical semi-definite programming optimization problem then is here, um, the, um, uh, the, the, this in a product that corresponds to also to the to the Frobenius norm. Uh, so here the the sum of all multiplied uh, entries of the matrix. Uh, so here um, this would correspond. Uh, this term here it actually is a really close uh, closely corresponding to to the um, um, to the product we use for linear programming. So this here would correspond to uh, C transposed X, and now I'm putting a bar on top. So if I would take the matrices and pull the, uh, put them into a really long column vector uh, by, by reshaping them, um, then I could write this also as uh, C transposed X. Okay, and so this is the target function for the objective function for the canonical um, uh, semi-definite program. And then I also have uh, here these uh, equality constraints and uh, the X is, is required to be in the, in the positive uh, semi-definite uh, cone. Okay, and uh, there are also for this, there are many practical applications. Uh, famously, we can use SDPs to approximate combinatorial optimization problems. In uh, computer science, we all hear about, for example, the traveling salesman problem, which is an NP hard problem. And there are other ones, for example, there's the max cut problem that is described down here. So given a graph, how to partition it so that the edges between the two partitions uh, have a maximum weight. This is also an NP hard problem. Um, so many NP hard problems, for example, those in the SAT class, I can translate between these problems and uh, so solving one of them means solving all of them. Uh, and here uh, we know that for, for this max cut problem, uh, we can write it down or approximate it with an SDP problem and uh, get a solution that is really close to the optimum, so nearly 90%. Um, and uh, that's good. So at, as a baseline, uh, if, if we know how to solve SDP fast, uh, there are many uh, NP hard problems uh, where I can get a really really good approximation already or a really a solution that is that is that is close to being optimal. Okay, um, there are other applications that are of practical relevance. For example, the localization of wireless sensors. So imagine you have many wireless sensors in the field. Uh, it could be, for example, cell phones and uh, you want to do a precise localization of all the cell phones uh, from the signal strength that you get back from them. Uh, if you have cell towers with known location, then it's easy, because if you have cell towers with known location, then you can like triangulate and so on. 
uh, but uh, it would be even better if uh, we would uh, if we could consider a mesh network because maybe the mobile phones they also see each other and then we not only have the distance to the cell tower that we can look at but we also see the distance between the mobile phones or the wireless sensors uh, where they see okay how strong is the signal to 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 to, to the neighbors and so on and um, um, so what we do is we recover or estimate the distance between our wireless sensors and uh, we do that by looking at the signal strength and we describe the distances here as this dij squared okay and the big question is how can we combine all these different distance estimations into uh, position predictions for all the sensors that i have in my mesh and um, well what we can do is um, combine uh, all our position vectors into uh, a big big matrix and uh, write down this equation here where um, the d the dij um, um, squared here can be written down like like this equation and then by doing some additional transformations i end up with an sdp uh, however the sdp is an approximation um, and it gives us constraints so here uh, this is an sdp where um, uh, i'm looking for a matrix big y um, and I'm looking for any matrix big Y that holds these const these constraints, and um, and um, and then uh, I have greatly reduced the the number of possible uh, locations of the sensors that I'm looking at. And here in the paper of Doherty, for example, he uses then the SDP to reduce the search space or the the space of possible locations for every. Um, sensor that I have uh, to something that is a really tight approximation. Okay, so this would be a practical application of, of, of SDP and uh, go have a look at, at Doherty if, if you're interested in, in technical details that, that we don't have the time here for. Okay, um, and a last application of uh, semi-definite programming uh, that we're looking at here is the so-called blind deconvolution. Now, um, this is also an application from computer vision. Uh, suppose that you have a blurry image Y, uh, so you have taken a shaky camera picture or something like that, and uh, the idea is that um, the, the process that constructed this blurry image um, it's like having a sharp image first and then apply, applying a so-called blur kernel to it. So um, here you see the, this blur kernel K and you, you can somehow see the, the, the ways, the movements in, in how the camera was shaking. And um, so uh, there is a convolution operator and uh, you might know convolutions also from, from lectures on uh, convolutional neural networks. Um, so here the, the convolution operator, it takes um, pixels in, in, a, in, a, in a rectangular area and combines it into an output pixel. So here we would have this area and all these would be combined by the blur kernel into exactly this pixel over here. Yeah. Uh, and then the, 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 this rectangular window that we're looking at, it is moved one pixel over. And then we are looking at this window, apply the convolution to it, and then uh, the end result will be this, this pixel in, in the blurry image. And uh, well, we say there is this convolution operator uh, and the blur kernel that uh, transforms the clear image into the blurry image. And there is some additional noise. Um, now, when we know this blur kernel, we can try to reverse it uh, and uh, we do that by writing it down as an optimization problem where we say well we know the k and we know the blurry image that was given to us by the camera and uh, what we want to do is we want to recover this x here 
uh, in a way that the uh, that the total variation noise of the recovered image is low. And uh, so this is a deconvolution that estimates the original image from the blurry image and the, the known blur kernel. However, in many cases, I don't have the blur kernel available because I don't exactly know how the camera was shaking. Um, and uh, I, But I can still apply optimization here. And now it's called blind deconvolution. And there is a, a huge number of, of literature out there. And a very famous paper by Ahmed and uh, Ben Recht is um, on using convex optimization for blind deconvolution, where uh, they are estimating the blur kernel and the clear image at the same time. And uh, this is a really powerful method because you can take a blurry image, however it was constructed, if somebody used a Gaussian blur from Photoshop on it or if somebody uh, was shaking the camera, it uh, doesn't matter. Um, and uh, it takes this blurry image, like here this license plate from the car, and uh, reconstructs it as much as possible. And oftentimes there is enough useful information in the image so that uh, I can make, for example, here the license plate readable once more. So this is really like a, a James Bond technique of taking a bad image and enhancing it in order to then get the license plate and, and, and possibly get after the, the bad guys. Um, and well, what these, what many of these papers then say, well, here is a, a complicated construction, and the, in the end we get an STP to solve, and then we solve that with standard methods. And the question is, what are these standard methods? So how can we solve um, um, STPs or conic problems in, in general? What are the important ideas here? 